Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Sorry, I was actually the last one in the room when I probably should have been the first one in the room. But um, my name is Steve Healy. For those of you who don't know me, um, I'm the managing partner of RSM in Brisbane uh, and also Moonlight as a tax partner. But you won't be hearing from me talking about tax today. You will be hearing from two of my colleagues or three of my colleagues, actually, uh, Sam, Sam Muhammad, uh, who's our head of indirect tax nationally and is based here in Brisbane, Belinda Crowley. Um, Belinda is a principal in our corporate tax division and Mike Kilaneva, who's a manager in our corporate tax division. So there is uh, quite a lot to get through. Um, we, uh, uh, I think there's, there's a number of um, rulings, there's a number of court decisions, there's some controversial measures before, uh, before parliament at the moment as well that we'll, we'll talk through. Um, and this is also the first time, and welcome to our online uh, guests. Uh, great to have you here as well. The first time we've actually streamed our update um, via webinar as well. So, yeah, thanks. Uh, so, a welcome. Now, first of all, I have to give a, a uh, unapologetic plug, except my, that's not working. Neither is that. That is. Um, we, we're really, really quite happy, the RSM people in the room today, because we've just been uh, voted by you, by our clients, uh, for the sixth year running as the best accounting consulting services firm um, above $200 million. So that's just a, as I say, unashamed, you know, plug. And uh, those those awards um, uh, were just announced today. So, um, uh, so again, thank you to, to everyone, to all of our clients, um, including yourselves, uh, the work we, we love working with you. And uh, those sorts of things wouldn't be possible without that and without you. So <clears throat> just, I guess, uh, just flicking through the agenda, and I'll very soon hand over to Belinda, I think, initially. Mike, initially. Thanks, Kalina. Um, there are a whole lot of things that we want to get through today. We may not get through them all in a in a great deal of detail because there are a number of a number of updates. Um, but you'll see there the the agenda. Um, I might at this point hand over the control to Mike, and uh, and I'll sit down for a little while and return at the end. So thank you again. Thanks, Steve. Um, as you mentioned, yes, there's a fair bit to get through. Not all company tax, we've got some individual tax, um, your FPT, we've got everything accused today. So I'll start with, one sec, make sure this works. So payday super. So you might recall on the 23, 24 budget, um, the, the government said we're gonna do payday super. We want super paid on the day that employees get paid. So in November, they re released a consultation paper um, for comment from the public. So they had two models they wanted consultation on. The first model was that the employee would be required to pay, to pay a super on the same day that the employee is paid. And the second is a due date method, which is depending on your payment cycle, you'll have to pay super within a few days and then there'll be a mandatory deadline on that. So the proposed changes are, um, are going to take effect by 1 July 2026. Uh, so the entire scheme is very much in its infancy at the moment, um, but it'll be interesting to see how it develops over the next few years. I said this time next year, and um, we'll have a pretty good idea of what it's going to look like. Second one is, uh, so unrealized super gains. So the, um, so the Treasury Law Amendment Better Targeted Superannuation Concessions Bill in 2023 proposed an introduction of 15% uh, tax on earnings and superannuation funds above $3 million. So if this applies to you, well done. Uh, <laughs> uh, for members with superannuation balances at the end of the financial year um, that have they've moved that have moved in value, they're going to tax by 15%. So the way they do that is they look at the opening balance and the closing balance, and that's your the taxable earnings in, for the for the tax. And the ATL will apply 15% on that. So um, given the members' total super balance, superannuation balance might not be actually realized, so they might have a SMF with uh, properties in there. This is this is going to be an issue for cash flow. Um, so so, uh, so yeah, so you so you have that 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 payment, and then if you're in a loss position, you can carry that forward as well. So they kind of they tried to accommodate losses there, um, but the levies the tax is actually levied on the individuals themselves. So you'll get the assessment levied on you, and you have to decide whether you can pay it out of your personal income you have at the moment or through your um, superannuation fund. So as you can imagine, there was some scrutiny when this came out by a fair few people and a lot of the bigger institutions submitted are sent in submissions. And the two major points that came out of those submissions was one that the the loss should be carried backwards as well. They felt like that was more equitable. If you if you get, you know, pay tax in one year and you lose it, then the value goes down, then you should be able to offset it with pre prior year losses. 
And the second one, that the $3 million threshold wasn't indexed. Um, so essentially, you know, it might seem like a lot of money now, but in another 10 years, it might not be that much. And you've got more people paying this 15% super on the movement in their account. Oh, FPT Linda. So I was just going to run through a couple of the FBT changes um, in the last few months. Um, so the first one I wanted to mention was the ATO's new ruling on the self-education expenses. Um, obviously, the ruling doesn't directly deal with FBT, um, but it's highly relevant given the um, interplay with the otherwise deductible rule. Um, so the issue follows the removal um, of the denial of that first $250 in uh, self-education expenses. So previously, you couldn't deduct that first $250. Now, now it's wholly deductible, um, but you've obviously got to tick off the requirements of Section 8.1. Um, the ruling talks at length about the nexus between the self-education expense and the, um, I guess, production of your assessable income. Um, and most of the examples actually focus on that nexus. It reiterates the two heads under which the expenditure is deductible. So firstly, that being maintaining or increasing your specific knowledge in a current role, or secondly, that it will lead to or that it's likely to lead to an increase in your income. Um, there are lots of examples, as I said, but there are also quite a few examples around when amounts are not deductible. So um, that includes where, if you like, transferring positions within an organisation. So there's an example around a software um, engineer who's going to move into a HR position and the company says, do this course and we'll move you. Um, so that's not deductible, even though you do get a um, higher income. Um, if the education is too general, um, it won't have a sufficient link um, and nor will there be a sufficient link if the um, education doesn't provide a real prospect of promotion um, within sort of a reasonable period. Um, so it needs to be currently relevant. Um, the ruling covers off on the types of costs that are deductible. So it talks about course fees, um, interest, travel and accommodation expenses, books, those types of things. Um, and it's, it's worth looking at if you've got those self-education expenses that you're funding on behalf of employees to make sure that there's no FBT. Um, the second one is the record keeping alternatives for FBT. Um, so this is obviously now law. Um, it allows the commissioner to provide alternatives to the prescribed record keeping, um, although it doesn't actually reduce the amount of records that you need to keep. So all it does is, for example, say if the legislation said you need to keep a travel diary, you don't actually have to keep a travel diary now, but what you do need to still keep is evidence um, of what you did on each day, so whether that's an itinerary or something like that. So it um, it reduces the requirements, but kind of not really. <laughs> Um, the measure applies from the 1st of April 2024, so it's not actually valid for this year. Um, and for it to apl have application, the commissioner needs to first make a determination about it. So he'll say, for diaries, you can use this instead, or for, say, a living away from home allowance declaration, you can keep these types of records instead. So there's nine of those determinations now, so it's just a matter of checking whether what you're looking at fits into one of those categories. Um, and then the final point on that slide there is just um, given FBT season is upon us, um, the ATO is making a lot of noise around dual cab vehicles um, and they're really going to crack down on them this year. So if you're using them often, they'll be treated as exempt on the basis that they're not a motor vehicle. Um, that doesn't mean they're exempt. It means that they possibly fall in the residual category. So you've got to watch that and be aware that the ATO is looking at it. Um, is it that one? Okay. Um, so for those that attended our last update, um, we talked about the decisions in personnel contracting and JAMSEC. Um, so that was now a complete waste of time <laughs> um, because the led we've now got legislation which effectively overrules those. Um, so the legislation, um, I guess, codifies the totality test, which is what the ATO has always looked at when determining whether you've got an employee or a contractor. Um, so those decisions of the High Court sort of said, no, you actually look at the contract in the absence of being that it being a sham. That's no longer the case. You need to now look at all the um, sort of the totality of the arrangements. Um, 
this uh, legislation was also in the bill that had the, the right to disconnect um, provisions, which were a bit um, popular in the media. There was also some changes to casual employment laws, but I don't um, propose to talk about any of them. Um, so again, back in the position that we now were, um, so you need to look at things like um, how the individual is held out with the organisation, on what basis they're paid, whether it's a time versus a result, um, and those types of things. There is an option to opt out of the rules, um, and it applies where the individual earns more than the contractor higher income threshold. Um, don't know, yet know what that is, um, hasn't sort of been specified. Um, and the last bit is these changes apply retrospectively. So they obviously overcome any of the decision of the High Court. So I'm just going to cover some of the more significant um, guidance updates from our last update. So one of them we did cover already last time, but to a very high level because the tax ruling was still in draft. And that's uh, TR 2024-1, which addresses uh, the depreciation of composite assets. So um, broadly, a composite item is an item that's made up of a number of components and each are capable of having one, becoming one asset. So prior to this ruling, the Tax Act, rather unhelpfully, um, defined a composite asset, uh, asset as uh, whether a composite item is itself depreciating, a depreciating asset or whether its components are separate depreciating assets is a question of fact, and then the degree of which can only be determined in light of all the um, facts, which is the kind of their way of saying we, we haven't thought about it too much yet. So we're just going to say you have to consider it on a case by case basis, which is still the case, but now they've given a lot more insight. So it, the legislation actually gave two examples as well. The first one was pretty sensible and applied to most people, which is a car. So a car is made of lots of pieces, but it's actually one composite asset. The other one, which is equally relatable, was a floating restaurant, um, which was not a composite asset. It was, it was comprised of lots of separate assets. Um, so there's the five tests, which are all focused around functionality. So the first one is the depreciate, depreciating asset will ordinarily be an item that performs a separate identifiable, identifiable function, having regard to the purpose it serves and the, in the business context. The second one there is that the item may be identified as having a discrete function and therefore as a depreciating asset without necessarily being self-contained or used as a, on a standalone basis. Uh, the third one is the greater the degree of physical uh, fun, uh Functional integration with another asset is usually an indication that it's a composite item. Uh, the fourth one, so when the effect of uh, attaching the item to another item it, on its own, in, it increases its uh, performance or functionality, then that's probably a sign that they're two separate assets because it changes the initial assets function in the business. And the fourth one is when various um, components are purchased that make up one system, then they're probably going to be a composite item because the individual items don't particularly work without each other. So the ruling does go on in a fair bit of detail. However, we probably don't have time to cover it all now. But what the ruling can be used for is determining effective lives. So if there's an asset, it's actually made of multiple um, individual assets and they might have effect, different effective lives, which affects their depreciation rate. And secondly, for um, immediate tax write-off thresholds. So if you look at the instant asset write-off, which we're looking at a bit later today, um, you might have two um, individual assets you've immediately deducted. However, if you look at the, the guidance here, maybe it should have been one asset which breaches the $20,000 threshold. The second area we're going to talk about is R&D. So uh, there's the, the top 1,000 findings report released late last year. The R&D was, was an issue for most taxpayers, which is usually when you'll see the ATO start to release some tax alerts around this area. So there's been two tax alerts for R&D. So the first one's research and development activities delivered by associated entities, and that's uh, TA-23-4. And TA-23-5 is research and development activities conducted by overseas foreign related parties. So the overarching concern in both of these is that firstly, the activities, um, there was the risk of the activities were not included in the, or were not conducted for the R&D entity, which is the entity claiming the R&D incentive, or were conducted significantly for another entity. Or secondly, that the expenditure was not at risk for R&D purposes um, under, I think it's section 355, of the Income Tax Assessment Act. Um, so the ATO have expressly stated in these alerts that they're going to be reviewing any, any um, arrangements that do fit within the kind of these, these um, fact patterns. So we'll go over quickly TR 23.4. 
So this addresses R&D claims um, for expenditure incurred under an arrangement with an associate, which and it's usually some kind of service provider arrangement. So the term associate is defined in 318 of the 36 Act, I think, and it's particularly complex. So if taxpayers have gotten this wrong, then there's probably a good chance that they may, maybe the, the claim isn't it, it wasn't filed properly. So the specific concerns the ATO are looking at in these in this in this TA is um, incorrectly purporting that the R&D entity has incurred or paid or both the relevant expenditure under the agreement um, with an associate, or it has the effect of obtaining the R&D entity tax offset for an entity that probably shouldn't have claimed it in the first place. So what the ATO have seen generally um, is in these circumstances that usually the R&D trading entity that, that, that does the services is it used to be the entity in the group that did all the main, conducted all the main business activities. Um, so we'll jump to TA 2023-5. So this addresses arrangements where an Australian resident R&D entity claims tax offset for expenditure incurred on R&D activities, activities conducted overseas. So the ATO highlights um, instances where the R&D entity purported that the R&D activities were conducted for their own benefit, um, where those activities were actually conducted wholly or significantly for an overseas entity. So the ATO of... Um, basically said, please come to us if you have any arrangements sorting out this, uh, looking at that meet these fact patterns, because we'd like to talk to you about them, but I'd probably recommend you come to go to your uh, R&D advisors first. The last note here is that ATO have stated they're going to start publishing R&D information. So this, um, so this relates to our, uh, 2020, FY22 claims in our income tax return that included R&D. Um, and the information being published is going to be the name of the entity that claimed the incentive, uh, the ABN or ACN and the entity's total R&D expenditure as disclosed on their return. And that's, I think they're going to release it September, maybe. All right. Um, so I'm going to run through all the international changes that are going on. And there's a lot, um, a bit of a mix between, uh, I guess, measures that have now passed into law, measures that are about to pass into law, and um, measures that are coming a lot in a long way. There's also um, a case there and some ATO guidance, which I'll talk to. Um, so I'll start with uh, the thin cap measures, which have been on foot, I'm going to say for nearly a year now. Um, so where it's currently at is the Senate committee issued its final report in February. Uh, and the legislation as it now stands probably has enough support to pass. So it's probably going to pass in its current form. Um, it, it doesn't change the threshold for the application of the thin cap provisions in that you still need to sort of have a foreign controller or control a foreign sub, uh, but it does create a new class of general investor as opposed to the distinction between the inward and outward investor. <laughs> Um, in terms of actually claiming the interest deductions, there's now three new tests. Um, so these ones apply from 1 July 2023. Um, other parts of the thin cap legislation don't apply to a later date. So the first test, which is um, replacing what I'll term the safe harbour test, is called the fixed ratio test. Uh, and this is essentially denying any interest deductions um, above 30% of your tax EBITDA. Tax EBITDA is effectively your taxable income uh, before your debt deductions, but after the application of carry forward losses. And it also um, requires you to remove the R&D add back. So that obviously that R&D add back when you're claiming the offset increases your taxable income, which would allow you more interest deductions. So you don't get to um, add that back. Uh, this test is the default test. So if you intend to um, apply anything else, you need to elect to apply um, that other thing, the other test. Um, deductions under this can be carried forward for 15 years, although they are subject to a form of loss testing, so sort of a modified cot. Um, you can transfer these losses into a consolidated group, um, but again, it's also subject to meeting a, a modified cot or SBT. Um, in terms of the carry forward for 15 years, as soon as you choose another method, you lose all your carry forward deductions. So if you wish to keep them, you need to stick with this method. Um, the second test is the third party debt test. Um, so this effectively just allows deductions for your third party debt. Um, so it only applies to external debt. Um, and once you choose this method, 
all your related party deductions are, are not available. Um, also note that where you've got the third party lender, recourse can only be had to Australian assets under that loan agreement. So to the extent that you've got a foreign entity sort of guaranteeing that loan, then it's potentially not deductible under this test. And then the final test is the group ratio test. Um, so this is sort of the replacement, I guess, of the worldwide gearing test. Um, so it requires you to calculate the group's net third party interest expense to EBITDA ratio. So you're looking at the group's interest expense as a portion of its EBITDA, and then you apply that percentage to your taxable income to work out how much deductions you can, uh, you can claim. Um, the legislation also brings into place a debt creation rule. So this is sort of new. There was a debt creation rule about 20 years ago. It was repealed um, and now it's back. Um, so there's no deduction for interest if the debt is used to either pay a distribution to a related party um, or acquire a CGT asset from a related party. Um, it does exclude new depreciating assets from related parties or also newly issued membership interests uh, from related parties. This test applies from uh, 1 July 2024, but it does apply to arrangements entered into before that date. So the denial only sort of applies going forward, but just because your arrangement's old doesn't mean it doesn't fall under these rules. Um, it has no application if the third party debt test is being used. Um, practically, um, it effectively requires tracing of your debt where you've used it. And so it's going to be very difficult to uh, implement. Um, there's obviously going to be issues with post-acquisition restructuring. So if you're moving sort of entities around where you've acquired a multinational group, you want to bring an Australian subsidiary under the Australian um, group, then that will be an issue. Um, the other one is that um, technically trading stock is a CGT asset, so it potentially applies to um, sort of debt funding of trading stock from related parties. Um, the rules also expand the definition of a debt deduction. So the debt deduction now also includes guarantee fees and a range of fees or similar. Previously, previously it was largely limited to interest. Um, and then the final one is that there were initially some changes proposed to Section 2590 um, to deny deductions to the extent that they generated name income. So they're gone now, which is, um, I guess, a positive part to it. Um, just the subsidiary disclosure measures. Um, so these apply to listed companies only. Um, you just need to include within your accounts now information in relation to your foreign subsidiaries. Um, I've got some further information up there on the slide as to what you do need to include. Um, these are a part of the thin cap bill. So as soon as the thin cap bill passes, these will also pass. Um, so just a couple of the proposed measures. Um, so these are still, I guess, in their infancy a little bit, although there's been in the sort of public domain for a little while. Um, so the first one is the public country by country report, uh, reporting. Sorry. Um, so it's still in exposure draft form. It obviously applies to SGEs only. Um, the current draft, uh, which I think is February 24, splits the requirements into two categories. So you've got category one, which is reporting for Australia, and there's 41 other countries. Those 41 countries are generally tax havens. Um, and then there's sort of an everything else category. So the first category, um, the information that you need to disclose is, uh, I guess, far more detailed and more of it. You also need to do it sort of um, country by country. For everything else, you can aggregate it into one. Um, there is still an exposure draft, as I said. Um, the next one, which is also still an exposure draft form, is the denial of deductions for intangible payments. Um, it has a proposed start date of 1 July 2023, so we're obviously well into that year. Um, I'd like to hope that that will be changed, given that we don't have anything firm to go on at this point. Um, so this requires a relevant payment, so an Australian entity making a payment to an offshore entity and the recipient of that payment needs to be in a jurisdiction with a headline rate of less than 15%. 
Um, there are exceptions if the amount is subject to royalty withholding tax, um, if there's CFC attribution, um, or if their payment is actually subject to tax of less than 15%. Just on this, um, this is being developed in conjunction with all the Pillar 2 items. Um, so there's been a bunch of releases on Pillar 2, but there's still no draft legislation. So I haven't, not going to talk about them today, but maybe, maybe next time we'll talk about Pillar 2. Um, Um, okay, so Pepsi is a um, case about royalties. Uh, so the facts at a very high level um, were Schweppes Australia, which was a wholly owned subsidiary of PepsiCo, this a US company, makes Pepsi, Pepsi and all those other beverages. Um, so it made payments to a Singaporean, Singaporean related party for um, the concentrate. <laughs> um, so, you know, the fluid that you put in with the water and um, mix it to make the Pepsi. So the, to, um, the case looked at two years. I think it was 20, um, I think it was, yeah, 18 and 19, I think. Um, so total payments made for the concentrate across those two years were approximately 200 million. Um, the agreement provided that there was no payment for the use of PepsiCo's trademarks um, for the bottling formula or the bottling rights. Um, it was just a payment for the concentrate. The commissioner argued that part of the payment was for the trademarks, the bottling rights and the formula. Um, obviously, all those are subject to um, their royalties, so subject to withholding tax. The court agreed. Um, it said that the characterisation given to the payments by the parties isn't relevant. Um, you can't call a duck a chicken sort of thing. Um, key to its decision was that no entity would pay for the concentrate if it couldn't also use all the trademarks that were associated with the marketing of it. Um, and so the payment, it had to be in part in relation to those. Um, the court also found that it was inconceivable that PepsiCo would allow a third party to use its trademarks without payment. Um, and accordingly, again, part of the payment had to be a royalty. Um, incidentally, Pepsi's defence to that was that their business model was allowed to allow their trademark to be used to grow it in a particular jurisdiction, um, but the court didn't accept that. Um, it found that the royalty component was 5.88% of the total payments, um, which is obviously an, an apportionment and which is helpful because the ATO has very limited guidance on the apportionment of payments. Um, there's they relied on um, two expert evidence, one of the ATO and one from Pepsi. Um, the ATO's expert had a lot of experience valuing IP, Pepsi's um, not so much, and so the court gave a lot of weight to the ATO um, expert witness rather than um, Pepsi's expert witness. Um, they both, both agreed that the most appropriate method was sort of a comparable, so a cup, um, a comparable uncontrolled price, um, and that the commissioner's export expert provided more compelling reasons for why he'd picked the rate that he had, which was obviously the 5.88. I think Pepsi was arguing for 2.5. Um, the court also found that in the event the amount wasn't a royalty, then the diverted profits tax would have applied um, as there was a scheme with the purpose of the diverting um, the profit or for not having to pay withholding tax. Um, so Pepsi has appealed. Um, which is interesting <laughs> given um, its diverted profit tax assessment is about 30 million versus a 3 million royalty withholding tax assessment. Um, so if they um, lose on the royalty argument, um, sorry, if they lose on both arguments, they're going to be up for a, uh, a 30 million bill rather than a 3 million bill. Um, the other one is that straight after this case, um, the commission issued a DPT assessment to Coca-Cola on pretty much the same basis. So I think it's coming now that they've got this authority to stand behind some of their positions. Um, okay, so tax ruling 20... Oh, I've got one around the wrong way. Um, so PCG 2024-1... Um, so this sets out the ATO's compliance approach to intangibles migration um, and when it's likely to apply 
compliance resources to these dealings. So this obviously applies to international related party dealings only. It applies to both new and existing arrangements. Um, so intangibles migration is very wide. Um, it is, um, it's, I think it's pretty much any restructure or change associated with the taxpayer's intangible assets that allows another entity to access, use, transfer, or hold the intangible. So pretty much any dealing with an intangible asset. Um, there are two parts to the ruling, the migration of intangibles outside of Australia. So that's, for example, the sale or the granting of a right to use. And the other one is the mischaracterization of the DMP activities. So development, enhancement, maintenance, protection, exploitation. So for example, if you're letting a related party use an intangible, but not um, being compensated for it. So the PCG sort of sets out a framework that allows a taxpayer to ass assess um, whether the ATO is going to be concerned with their arrangement. It follows a, a points risk rating. It's very similar to the, um, the PCG around interest deductibility. Um, so there's five categories ranging from red, in which case they're not going to apply compliance resources through, I'm sorry, green, they won't apply them. Red, they definitely will. Um, so remains to be seen what disclosures will be required on the tax return. So it will almost certainly be part of the reportable tax position. Um, unsure whether you'll also need it as part of a wider IDS. So the RTP obviously applies um, to groups with turnover above 250 mil or um, foreign group with Australian turnover above 25. Um, just in relation to the reportable tax position, so the start date for disclosures, and also how far back you need to disclose. So it obviously applies to past arrangements. So to the extent that you need to disclose past ones, um, it's expected to be included within the RTP instructions when they come out. There are some excluded arrangements. So outbound distribution, um, inbound distribution, and also low value services. Um, there are a lot of examples in the PCG. There's 15 across all sort of different categories. Um, the PCG also sets out all the evidence expectations um, that the ATO has, which I think generally exceed the current requirements under the transfer pricing um, provisions in 815. So it really focuses on things like the commercial considerations, like why are you moving the asset, um, legal form, um, evidencing the intangibles themselves that they actually exist. Um, and also they're asking for evidence of sort of the top tax and profit outcomes. Um, and then just quickly back to tax ruling 2024-1. Um, so again, keeping with the intangibles theme. Um, so this is the ATO's updated draft ruling on when a payment in relation to software will be a royalty. Um, so this follows on from uh, draft ruling TR 2021 D4, which at the time that it came out was quite controversial. Uh, I think it was generally accepted that it very much expanded the different definition of royalty for um, for in the context of software, certainly beyond what the OECD has in its guidance. Um, the ruling itself has two scenarios, both of which um, are not surprisingly royalties. Um, so the key difference between the two is that one of them is quite specific, the other one is quite general in terms of the rights granted under the um, agreement, but nonetheless, both of them are royalty. Um, it's it sort of, there's a case, um, IBM, the IBM um, I think it's against the commissioner, um, but in that case, the court held as a federal court decision that the IP rights um, are necessary for the use, marketing and distribution of the relevant product and accordingly the entire amount is a royalty. So you can't separate it into different components. So the whole thing is a royalty. Um, just in terms of the two scenarios, so um, the first one deals with an Australian company that engages with the customer, but the software itself comes from a non-resident. So in that case, the ATO considers that while the Australian co actually never has access to the software, so it doesn't use it as such, um, by entering into the agreement with the customer, it is authorising um, or sort of publishing the software and therefore publishing of the software is an exclusive right of the copyright owner. So that's a royalty. Um, it's very, 
bit of a stretch, but that's how the BITO gets there. Um, in the second scenario, the Australian entity um, again contracts with the customer, but in this case, the agreement is for the Australian entity to resell the product. Um, and there's a side agreement. I don't know how often that happens in practice, um, but the ATO still considers that's a royalty as the end user is ultimately paying for access to the IP. So to the extent that the Australian company makes any payment to the foreign company for that, then that's a royalty. Um, note that the characterization of the payments in the agreement carries little weight, which is obviously strengthened by the decision in PepsiCo. Um, how do you get out of it? Um, there's probably a little scope for software arrangements to get out of it. Um, the only one is that there is a comment in it around distribution rights um, not being subject to royalty withholding tax. So if you could argue that part of your agreement provides a distribution right, um, which is separate and can be valued to the actual IP, then maybe you could exclude part of it, but um, it doesn't provide any guidance on how you would evidence that. So good luck. Um, I guess it's just a TP issue. Um, certainly, I think the clear contract drafting would help. So clearly saying that some of it is for a distribution right. Um, and if you put an amount in, so long as it's proportional, maybe that will help. Um, also, just as a side note, um, tax ruling 2014-1 provides some guidance um, between the allocation of licences and services when that's an issue. Okay, that's all. <laughs> hey guys, just so quickly on private groups. So, um, yeah, Administrative Appeals Tribunal being tribunals uh, recently found in the Bendel case versus the commissioner that an unpaid present entitlement to income or capital of, of a trust estate uh, payable to a private company did not constitute a loan under the deemed dividend rules of uh, Division 7A. So the crux of the argument for the AAT was that a UPE didn't meet the conditions required under Section 109D um, of the 36 Act, specifically that a UPE didn't meet the financial accommodation requirements in Section 109D. Uh, 3B, but they're highlighted or bolded. Um, so the ATO released a decision impact statement straight away after this because it's contrary to a very long-standing belief that uh, deemed dividends to companies were, um, sorry, distributions companies, unpaid uh, UPs to companies were paid deemed dividends, sorry. <laughs> um, and basically they reaffirmed their existing position, which, and they cited TD 2022-11, which is basically a, a addresses that exact issue. So the ATO seem really confident around their position with the appeal. Um, so it'll be interesting to see where it goes. Uh, so the second, oh no, the second point, so just a couple of miscellaneous updates as well. So general interest charges, um, after 1 July 2025, taxpayers will no longer be able to deduct general interest charges or shortfall interest charges. Consequentially, um, when they're remitted, they're also not included as accessible income. So we've got the instant asset write-off for small businesses. So in the 2023-24 um, federal budget, um, the, the government said we're going you know, to put these back in place. So they've also increased the, um, the threshold to $20,000 for small businesses with a uh, turnover of less than $10 million. So it was extended to in the income year 30 June 2024. However, it's still yet to be legislated sitting in front of the Senate. Um, so this is an issue for small businesses because if it was legislated, they could have relied on it and they could have spent more aggressively throughout the year, but you know, the year's nearly ended, so that's going to have to kind of um, apply whatever they can if it gets passed in time. <laughs> so uh, the last, so the next one here, sorry, is deductions for holding lands, land um, uh, non-deductible. So in the Meekins and Commission of Taxation case, the uh, Administrative Appeals Tribunal found the taxpayer failed to establish entitlements to deductions for holding costs relating to um, land that remained undeveloped 17 years. So when he purchased the land, there, there was plenty of evidence say he was going to build a property on it, it was going to be a rental property, and he had all this stuff. And then there was also, you know, bits and pieces of evidence that he still intended to do it over the period of time. However, after 17 years, the agency said, look, basically it's not holding land. Um, so they denied the deductions. So I guess the principle there is that, um, yeah, deductions for holding vacant land is, are, are not deductible. Oops. And the third point here is just tax cuts. So I thought we'd briefly mention... As of 1 July 2024, the 90% tax rate reduced to 16% for income earners between 18 and 45,000, and the 32.5% tax cut is reduced to 30% 30, 30 for income earners between 45 and 135,000. 
So I also have to run straight after this. So if you've got any questions on my section, please either email me or ask for them. <laughs> Don't direct them to me. Um, okay, just um, quick updates under what I'll loosely term capital management. Um, the um, passage of the provisions which deny a franking credit for distributions which are funded by capital raising. Um, these provisions, I think, were first announced back in 2015, so they've been a long time coming. At the time, they said they would apply retrospectively, but thankfully, that's not going to be the case. I think they apply from, like, the 28th of November last year that the legislation was passed. Um, they apply to out-of-cycle dividends that are directly or indirectly funded by the issue of new equity interests. Um, and then the second point there is the um, new legislation in relation to the treatment of off-market buybacks. So this obviously only applies to listed entities. Previously, um, we had an off-market buyback that Purchase price came out as part capital, part dividend, which was helpful for some investors, corporate and super funds in particular. From now on, any listed company off-market buyback is just treated the same as an on-market buyback in that all the proceeds are capital. So it's probably better for individuals, but for those other um, entity types, not so much. Um, and then, uh, must, oh, is it on the next slide? Um, just final one is uh, the commissioner has released a determination on the application of his, of his to discretion to determine whether an entity controls another entity. So obviously this is relevant for all the aggregation provisions. Um, there is a part of that section is that where an entity owns between 40 and 50% of the entity, the commissioner has a discretion. You, you do control it unless the commissioner says that you don't control it. Um, so this ruling is around when he will say you don't control it. Um, so he needs to positively conclude that another entity or another two entities control the entity in order for him to say that you don't. Um, looking at the list of factors that um, they give reference to, really it's the functions of the board. Um, so things like determining capital, dividend, the management team, those types of things. So that's what you're going to need to look at when you're um, making any application for that. And I think that's all from me on the corporate tax side. I don't know if anyone has any questions now or... Okay. All right. Sam? Sam? All right. Sorry, Sam, I hope I've left you enough time. <laughs> Thanks, Belinda. Um, so as Mike alluded to um, when he was talking about R&D, the ATO has recently, say recently, um, toward the back end of last year, released a findings report. Now, this finding, findings report is in respect of its um, two main assurance programs, uh, which are the top 100 and the top 1,000. Uh, so there are different, um, I guess, requirements as between the two. But given, I guess, the audience, predominantly most people in the room, um, if they're subject to one of those assurance Programs would be in the top 1,000, so I'll, I'll kind of stick to that mostly. Um, I was in a little bit in two minds as to whether I'd go through the report. I think to some extent people might be a little bit fatigued around tax governance and justified trust. But um, that being said, this report is actually a fairly significant report from the ATO. Um, they do put a lot of time and effort into it, and in speaking to them, they do kind of stick quite closely to um, what they find and, and, and the guidance they're giving to taxpayers. So I guess from that perspective, it's important to know what is coming out of um, uh, recent reviews. So um, if we're looking at the top 1,000 um, programs, so that's a program around being assured or having justified trust that a taxpayer is paying the right amount of tax at the right time. That's kind of the fundamental definition of, of justified trust. Um, really, uh, I guess... If, if we're looking at it holistically, the, what the ATO um, has is some broad, um, uh, I guess, categories of, of where they put taxpayers. And, and fundamentally, which category you're in will dictate their future compliance resources towards you. So you can see here that if you're in the, in the green or high assurance category, that the ATO has a pretty, um, uh, is assured of the fact that you're paying the right amount of tax at the right time. They don't really have any great concerns. And generally speaking, they will leave you alone for the period of the review or the assurance period, which is generally about four years. 
Uh, if you're in the medium category, then um, they, they have a general level of assurance, but there might be some specific areas that they either don't have assurance or they have some concerns over. And then you're in the low um, category, which is essentially um, they have no assurance or a very little assurance or they have high areas of concern and risk. Um, what you can see there is, is um, this is these assurance ratings are a function of their findings across the four pillars. And for those who've um, been to kind of previous sessions around justified trust, those four pillars are one around tax governance, which is essentially the, the main pillar, and we'll get to some of the findings there. Um, the second is around risk flag to market. So if you're in a particular industry, so I think, you know, software with intangibles is specific risks. Um, if the ATO has already got some guidance products out there, then try and stick to it. Uh, how are you dealing with significant transactions? Um, you know, are you dealing with complex issues in a different way to your standard day-to-day -day business? Um, uh, and the last one is around um, reconciling your book to tax. And specifically for GST, that was called out, that historically that's not been a focus for a lot of taxpayers, but it is now a compulsory element of all top 1,000 reviews. Um, and unless you're in the kind of financial services space, um, what the ATO essentially expects is that you are doing regular, which is generally periodic uh, or annual um, book to tax, which is looking at your, uh, your, your BASs and reconciling that back to your financial statements, generally using the, the GAT or the GST analytical tool methodology. So the ATO has a um, spreadsheet, which um, is their methodology. So happy to share that with you and happy to talk more details around how the GAT works. Um, but that is a fundamental and uh, requirement of uh, the, the top 1,000. Um, you can see here the different ratings. I won't go through the ratings. Obviously, you can see them on the screen. But what I do want to just quickly show you is um, uh, this is the ratings for just tax governance. So I mentioned before there's four pillars. This is the main pillar, which is around tax governance. You'll see here there's a correlation between the ratings that you will get in stage one, which is here 64. So 64% of taxpayers that were in the review period were given a stage one rating. And I'll talk about what that means. And you'll see here that's roughly medium assurance is about the same number. And the same for the high assurance, which is your stage three. Um, effectively, what the ATO says is that unless, um, so you, if, if you're at stage one, the maximum that you can get in terms of your broader assurance is medium. So there is a correlation between your overall assurance and your tax governance, which is why tax governance is such a big piece. Um, these are just the GST findings. So there are a, so if you are in the top 1,000, you might be in there for income tax, but you may not be there for GST or vice versa. Um, so that's why the results slightly differ, but it's also a function of the fact that some taxpayers um, put a lot of effort into income tax, maybe not so much in GST, and you'll see that they might have different ratings. Um, or vice versa. So that's why they will have different ratings for GST and different ratings for income tax. Um, the report itself is about 50 odd pages. There's a lot more graphs and details. So I just wanted to focus on the GST section. Uh, top 100, the expectations are obviously a bit higher. You know, if you're the kind of BHPs and RIOs of the world, the expectation is that you're going to have a lot more dedication in terms of resources, um, you know, advisors and that type of um, uh, effort put into your tax. Um, so that's why you, you'll see some discrepancies between the top 100 and top 1,000. Like I said, I won't go into too much detail around the top 100 other than to note that um, the percentages do look a little bit different, um, but not not greatly. Yes, again, you can probably see the medium assurance is, is probably the one where there's a little bit um, a little bit higher in the in the in the top 100. Wanted to just quickly pause on tax governance in particular. So these are the ratings that the ATO gives um, to taxpayers around tax governance. So this is around having a broader framework um, to make sure that you're paying the right amount of tax. So it's obviously you're going to have your your day-to-day your -day systems, your people, your process technologies, but it's it's kind of bigger than that. You know, what is the level of involvement of the board? Are they setting the right tone? Um, are they being kept informed? That's kind of what this is looking at. So if you've got no evidence, if you've got no tax policy that's been board endorsed, that's your that's your bad category. Um, obviously, to get off the start line and to get to that stage one, you have to have at least that that documented tax policy 
And ideally, you would have done some sort of gap analysis between what the ATO expects to see, which is their, um, they've got a governance guide, and what do you currently have in place. That kind of gets you your stage one rating. What gets you from stage one to stage two is having a well-designed um, testing plan. So that would be ensuring that your key tax processes like your BASs and your income tax returns um, are documented so that if you know the preparer got hit by a bus tomorrow, could someone step in, fulfil the role and not miss a beat and the right amount of tax gets paid. Um, it's also around having regular testing. So it's, it's ensuring that not just that you're doing things correct from a prospective basis, but you're looking at things historically and going back and looking at 12 months or 18 months or how many months or years worth of data and saying, hey, did I pay the right amount of tax two or three years ago? That's the design element that gets you to stage two. What gets you to stage from stage two to stage three is having that operationalized so that the ATO is comfortable with the fact that what you've designed actually works. And if you find any errors, you go back to the start, you fix it, and then you, you redo your, um, your operational testing plan. So you can see here that um, if you compare these numbers, so this findings report has been around for about five years. Um, these numbers have shifted. There's a lot less in the stage one that have moved into stage two, but stage three is still really, really difficult for people to get into, particularly from a GST perspective. Um, what the ATO is saying is that we still want to see more data testing. That's what's going to get you from stage two to stage three um, because fundamentally GST is kind of data and transaction driven. So if you have a miscoding, you're going to have every single transaction that falls within that category being incorrectly treated. So that's why it's so important to do kind of data testing to move you from stage two to stage three. Not too dissimilar in terms of the results um, between top 100 and top 1,000, um, probably a bit more in the stage three. Again, probably reflects the maturity of your top 100 businesses. Um, I guess a bit more of the dedication around having key processes automated. There's probably a bit more bass automation in the top 100 than there would be in the top 1,000, but it's not saying that you need that to get to the stage three rating. Um, these are some of the key areas that the ATO have flagged from a GST perspective um, that they're finding common errors. I won't go through each and every one of them. Probably the the... Two, I just want to flag would be financial supplies. Now, that's always going to be on the list. So in a day-to-day, -day, normal, you know, taxable widget business, um, you pay GST, you claim it back, it's 10%. I don't know why I have a job. Um, it's not very hard, right? Financial supplies is a little bit different because um, sometimes the GST is 10%, sometimes it's 0%, sometimes it's a number in between. Same goes on the input tax credit side. It could be I get 100% back, I get 0%, 75%, or any other number in between. Um, there's a whole bunch of um, subcategories within financial supplies that are really difficult, particularly if you're a taxable business and this isn't kind of core to what you do. So the ATO finds errors just about every review around financial supplies. So that's an area to keep in mind. Um, and the last one I just wanted to flag is around recipient created tax invoices. So yes, RCTIs can be quite useful because um, you as the customer, you might be better placed than your supplier actually knowing how much you've received. It might be better from a process and systems perspective. You might have any number of suppliers all giving you the same things um, and it's easier for you to kind of control that process. There are some really strict deadlines around when and how you can issue RCTIs and what they need to say and the ATO is finding um, a significant number of errors with RCTI. So I just wanted to flag that as well. Um, just changing tax. So I'll leave questions to the end, Steve, if that's easier. Um, so I'm a member of the ATO GST stewardship group. Um, doesn't impress my wife, but it's quite, um, it's, it's, a, it's a group which is uh, a number of um, advisors together with the ATO. And we kind of sit around the table uh, and talk about GST matters, you know, what we're seeing in the industry, where the ATO is focusing its efforts, um, what the forward program is kind of looking like. So there's a number of issues that are discussed. Some of the some of them are confidential. Um, some of them are published in the minutes. So I'm only going to talk about the, the public documents. I'm not going to talk about anything confidential. I'd like to keep my job. Um, the, one, the one that's kind of keeping the ATO awake at night is, is I, I've said fraud, but maybe fraud's a subcategory of the quantum of GST debt that is currently in existence. So if you kind of go back to 2019, pre-COVID, you were looking at a GST debt amount of around $30 billion, which was roughly, it was kind of in line with what the ATO was kind of tracking to. Um, it, had, it had grown, but it had kind of grown in line with GST collection. So it wasn't a 
a kind of stupidly large number in that context. Post COVID, it is now, or it had gotten up to about $60 billion. Um, a lot of that debt is actually small business and medium business debt. It's actually not really the, you know, the kind of large businesses that are um, party to that 60 billion. An element of that 60 billion, however, is fraud. Um, some of you may have heard of about, you know, the, the TikTok frauds, the GST. The, so there were people spruiking on TikTok and other kind of social media that, hey, all you need to do is register an ABN, plug a number into your first bass and magic, there's a refund. Um, you know, there were these pensioners, there were um, people who were unemployed getting half a million dollar refund checks um, and just swamping the system. And, and we're talking about 57,000, over 57,000 people. Um, now, there's probably some level of dispute about how culpable different um, parts of the system, say the ATO, played in, in paying out close to $2 billion of, of, of refunds, fraud. Um, and then I think there was probably close to double that that was actually stopped by the ATO. So um, to some extent, the systems worked. Um, to a large extent, the banks themselves were the ones that were kind of flagging it. You know, they've got a, they've, they themselves have um, their own fraud indicators. And if you've got a pensioner who quite clearly gets a thousand bucks every fortnight, suddenly gets $500,000 a fortnight, and then gets another one three months later in line with Bass um, from the ATO, you know, they're on the phone to the ATO and the ATO is saying we can't do anything about it because that's not how our systems work. Um, and they were going back through the Reserve Bank. Reserve Bank was going to the ATO and saying, hey, we need to do something. So there was, there were probably some breakdowns in processes or processes that didn't exist that allowed this to kind of go on as long as it did. Um, as a result of that, um, there's been a significant number of um, uh, criminal uh, sentences. People have gone to jail over it. Um, ATO is now going to put processes in place to kind of stop this. To some extent, I'm not sure who in the room or online may have um, kind of been collateral damage, but for anyone who's tried to put a big refund through, you probably had questions now going, hey, why is this massive refund? Um, you know, so it's, it's all kind of linked to the fact that there was significant fraud in the system. And as part of that, the ATO is kind of clamping down on major refunds because they'd rather not pay it if they don't have to. Now, I do have a little bit of sympathy for the ATO um, in the sense that they are hamstrung by what the law says. And the law effectively says that once you, as a taxpayer, lodge your BAS, ATO has got 14 days. They need to use it or lose it. They either use the 14 days to do their investigations. At the end of the 14 days, um, they haven't got enough evidence to then take it to an audit or to stop the refund, they have to allow the refund. That's what the law says. So to some extent, the sheer quantum of participants that were in and doing this was a, was a factor as to why so many um, got through. Uh, National, Audit Office has, uh, National Audit Office has done an investigation um, and has made a number of recommendations to kind of tighten the rules. ATOs um, tighten the ATOs in-house processes around fraud. ATOs accepted all of those um, recommendations. Um, so we wait and see what that looks like. And, and I guess the reason for raising it, and I appreciate no one in the room or on the call um, undertakes any fraud, but what it might what it might trigger is the fact that as you lodge your refunds, you may be getting more queries than historically you might otherwise, and it's kind of all part and parcel of this. Um, there are a number of other items that are on the agenda. Um, probably the one that I do just want to mention again in the in the interest of time is around the digitalization of GSC system. Um, E-invoicing, which is uh, at the moment kind of a, a big issue over in, over in the EU. Um, essentially how it links back to GST is if you don't issue as a supplier um, an invoice through the e-invoicing system, and then essentially that's that's the only mechanism by which you can issue a valid tax invoice. Flip side is it's the only if you only receive it through the e-invoicing system, then potentially that's the only way you can claim your credit. Any other type of invoicing is invalid. That's potentially where we might get to in Australia, but we're not we're not anywhere near that stage yet. Um, tax Admin 3.0 is uh, where tax just happens is the way it's been described to me. Um, you have your natural business systems, you go about your business, and then tax magically gets paid. Um, so it, what it might kind of lead to is more, uh, I guess, concepts around rather than having 
um, lag reporting where you have monthly or quarterly lodgements, it might be the case that as and when you make a physical payment, the GST or the tax might get carved out. Now, look, it's they're kind of, I won't say pie in the sky stuff, but that it, it is an active thing that is being discussed um, at the top levels is around how do we make tax form part of the transactions rather than being this whole separate process. Um, so I might leave it there. I think that was it. So I might hand back to Steve. Yeah, if you want to. Um... Probably we're pretty much at time, but, um, and uh, probably um, but open to any questions. I don't know if we can take questions via the webinar as well, if they, if they uh, pop up. Have we got some questions via the webinar? Yeah. Okay, so were there any questions from anyone in the in the room of um of, of Belinda or Sam? And if they're Mike and I, I can have a go, but I can't promise. But um yeah, there's a whole lot of stuff we went through today, and appreciate it was it was a it was a, a bit of a rush. These things are always really hard, particularly when there's so many developments. And we want to make sure we bring those to your attention. Um, you'll all have a copy of the of the slide deck. Um, and you can go through those in further detail, of course, in your own time. Uh, and it's certainly if you do have any questions around any aspect, um, it's a whole lot of, there's a few controversial things in there, particularly on the international front that, that Belinda touched on. A lot of stuff that we need to think about, as Sam was saying, around tax governance and the need to kind of keep the house in order on that side and know that the ATO is getting very, very active, uh, or they are very active at the moment. Um, and, uh, you know, there's there's a... Uh, every, a, a whole lot of things that affect us as individuals as well. You know, that that uh, uh, case around the AAT decision around the unpaid present entitlement, you know, there's no doubt at all that the ATO are, are going to run that one to the ground. Um, and I'd be very um, surprised if that doesn't kind of get reversed. But, um, yeah, so any questions at all before we wrap things up? And I know you've all busy people and you've got to get back to your offices. Troy. Sorry, a small question. Just Sam. Um, yeah, th thank you, Steve. Just one very small question. In, in regards to the top 100 um, review outcome um, from the report, I was curious what the basis for the 5% the unrated um, category of, of the top 100s related to. I'm just sort of, yeah, not, not quite sure why. Are, are they resulting from in-progress reviews or? I think uh, the ones, now I, I, I hadn't, picked up in the report as to why they were seen as unrated. But my past experience is the reason they're unrated is they just don't have sufficient information to give any level of assurance. It's not it's not negative assurance in the sense of saying, hey, we've seen a whole bunch of information and we're worried about it. It's just that there's insufficient information to provide any level of assurance over it in one of those three categories. Thank you. Any other questions? I'm guessing that's a resounding no, so you've got off lightly, Belinda. So, <laughs> but thank you, everyone, for, for coming. Um, for those on the webinar, thank you so much for attending. Um, and, again, really appreciate any feedback that you'd like to give us as well. Um, well, of course, we'll be back uh, again uh, to give you another quarterly update in about a quarter's time. So uh, thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks.